able to do away with domestic tyranny and violence and aggression by those in power against the rights of their own people only when we make all men answerable to the law. On November 21st, 1945, Robert Jackson was at the height of his prestige. The world watched as he started the most famous trial in history, a trial that would bring high-ranking Nazi leaders to justice. His friend Franklin Roosevelt had died. Now President Truman was asking him to prosecute the evil Nazi war machine at the first international criminal court in the history of the world. A brilliant writer and powerful speaker, Jackson had won nearly every oral argument he'd made before the Supreme Court. Could he win this trial too? And if he did, would the condemnation of aggressive war and the murder of six million people prevent it from happening again? Faith in the law is our last best hope, he would later write. Three weeks after President Truman was sworn in, he asked Robert Jackson to take an unprecedented leave of absence from the Supreme Court. Would he lead the American prosecution of the top Nazi leaders, including Adolf Hitler? Within days of Jackson's appointment as U.S. Chief Prosecutor, Hitler killed himself in a Berlin bunker. He had taken the easy way out. There was no protocol for the trial itself. So Justice Jackson led a group that had to convene a meeting of the Allies to determine would there be a trial, how the trial would be conducted, what the rules would be, who the defendants might be, and where it might occur. To bring to a just judgment those who have thought it safe to wage aggressive and ruthless war. An historic meeting in London was held. The chiefs of counsel for France, Russia, Great Britain, and the United States signed the International Military Tribunal Charter establishing the laws by which the major war criminals will be tried. The actual location of the trial was a subject of debate. The Russians thought it should be in Berlin because that's where they were currently occupying. Yet Justice Jackson traveled to Nuremberg, Germany. And even though Nuremberg was 90% decimated, just simply virtually wiped off the face of the earth. It's the building which was the Palace of Justice survived. It had damage, but it was survived. And it was important that the trial be conducted not only in Germany, but at a location which was significant for the Nazi party. And the Nazi rallies had been conducted since their beginning in 1932 at Nuremberg. The most significant decision of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg was its affirmation that the aggressive war is an international crime, and those who commit that crime must answer in a court of law for their aggressions. It was considered that uh, this trial would stand the test of history. Then Justice Jackson was insistent that every aspect of fairness and legality be followed by the tribunal and by the lawyers who made up the various uh, prosecution staffs. Uh, we adhered very strictly uh, to uh, uh, principles of uh, criminal procedure. We gave the defendants every advantage that they might have under the common law as well as the civil law. Before I die frage des Gerichtshofes beantworte, ob ich mich schuldig oder nicht schuldig bekenne. I informed the court, the, the court that defendants were not entitled to make a statement. You must plead guilty or not guilty. Bekenne mich im Sinne der Anklage nicht schuldig. 
Jackson steps to the podium on November 21, 1945 to open the Nuremberg trial. He's the first prosecutor to speak. And he gives an opening statement that's addressed to the eight judges and to the 20 defendants in the courtroom, but it's really addressed to the world. And it was addressed to history. And he had a, he had a, a real sense of the stakes and the significance. He worked hard to, to compose at his highest level of ability an opening statement that fit this occasion. And it's really one of the most eloquent, powerful courtroom speeches, or maybe speeches, period, or maybe written documents, period, in, in human history. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. He talks about the extermination of over five million Jews. That's how many are missing. They existed before the war and they don't exist now in refugee camps. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. The Nuremberg case is based on captured German documents. The conquering armies found offices and record keeping that was remorselessly precise. Uh, and much was destroyed, but much survived. And it made it possible to prosecute a case based on unambiguous records, with only one or two exceptions. No German defendant ever challenged the authenticity of a document. It's frankly a less exciting trial, even a boring trial, to have a documentary case. But it's a solidity of proof that Jackson thought fit the trial model and a secondary objective and a reason for his choice. It's a record for history. And so the Nuremberg trial both carries its burden of proof against the culpable defendants and gives us 42 volumes plus 12 volumes plus thousands and millions of pages that aren't in published form but are in repositories that show us what Nazism was and what Nazism did. In the official report, the Buchenwald camp is termed an extermination factory. The means of extermination? Starvation complicated by hard work, abuse, beatings, and tortures, incredibly crowded sleeping conditions, and sicknesses of all types. By these means, the report continues, many tens of thousands of the best leadership personnel of Europe have been exterminated. Bodies stacked one upon the other were found outside the crematory. The Nazis maintained a building at the camp for medical experiments and vivisections with prisoners as guinea pigs. Medical scientists came from Berlin periodically to reinforce the experimental staff. In particular, new toxins and antitoxins were tried out on prisoners. Few who entered the experimental buildings ever emerged alive. And that's on paper. And that's documented. They don't have the word Holocaust, but in the end they have the record that allows history to understand the Holocaust. And it takes scholars and, and the, the human mind, which has never tried to wrap itself around something so enormously evil, decades to fully begin to understand it. But it's possible because of what they did at Nuremberg. And Holocaust denial is a crackpot venture rather than a, a part of an even or respectable debate because it's up against the record that they assembled at Nuremberg. It's interesting to see Robert Jackson's face as he begins the process of prosecuting the individuals who were responsible for the destruction of Europe. You can see in his face the horror, the grimness, 
but also the righteous fury uh, that burned inside of him as he realized the depth of the horror. Challenge is to take that righteous fury and focus it so that you can prosecute appropriately, ethically, openly, and fairly, and to put the emotion aside to make sure uh, that truly the victims of atrocity are in fact represented at Nuremberg, at Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, wherever it may be. Despite that righteous fury in you, that you will move forward under the law to seek justice. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, that there are no slain, that there has been no crime.